Hello, I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Delighted that you've joined us for another in our series of conversations with giants in medicine. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with neurobiologist Carla Schatz, the director of the Stanford University BioX. Her research has been instrumental in our understanding of early brain development and how neural connections are formed. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about your path through science. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Happy to talk to you. Do you think you could start by telling me a little bit about your parents and your upbringing? Uh, yeah, because I think my parents have um, really influenced me heavily in terms of what I'm doing today and my interest in the brain and in neuroscience. My dad uh, was, I mean, neither are with us anymore, but my dad was an aeronautical engineer and a mathematician. Um, and my mom was a uh, painter who studied, in fact, with Philip Guston and was a very fine painter. And I think uh, I learned from an early age to love both science and art. And I also learned that it was okay for a girl and a woman to uh, you know, be a scientist. It was, not, you know, it was just fine uh, at dinner to have conversations about either topic. Uh, my dad was involved in the space race, and um, he was. Many of the things that he was working on at the time were top secret, but we we really could talk about the excitement of the engineering uh, challenges that were going on at the time, uh, and his work to design uh, gui guidance systems for the lunar landing module and things like that. And at the same time, you know, with my mother, we would go. My brother and I would go to the museums and uh, we became quite knowledgeable. So I think their influence made it really hard for me to figure out what I wanted to do when I, when I grew up. You know, should I do science? Should I do art? For a while I thought I would be an astrophysicist. <laughs> then I thought maybe I'll be an architect or you know, work in design or something like that. Um, but I think in the end, it, they're both, sets, both parents were really influential. And I remember reading that you also were a competitive skier and ballerina. Well, there you go again, the dad and the mom. So my father, uh, when he was younger uh, and was working during World War II on the West Coast, uh, met up with friends who would think, do things like climb mountains and ski down, which in the old days was pretty impressive. Um, and uh, so he had this real love of the mountains and skiing. and. Uh, he used to throw us in the car very early in the morning. We uh, grew up in Connecticut and, uh, you know, drive up to these little ski hills, which were very large at the time for us, um, and we would ski. And I, I became quite proficient, um, and I think it really influenced me in a kind of an unexpected way because uh, as a result of just being able to, you know, master some major uh, physical exercise, I think I had, it gave me courage to do other things. You know, one thing, when you ski, sometimes on some of these really steep black diamond um, trails, it seems like when you're at the top, you can't see the bottom. It's just so, <laughs> it's so steep. Um, and yet if you have faith in your uh, abilities, you know, you just push off and you somehow make it down the slope or uh, you know, you don't die anyhow. So where during this process did you decide you were going to do your bachelor's degree in chemistry? Yeah, uh, well, I think what happened is I had a, I mean, I went to, uh, to Radcliffe, which is now Harvard, as an undergrad, not knowing quite what I was going to do. But I love science fiction, so that's why I say I kind of thought, okay, I'm going to be an astrophysicist. But after, um, you know, about two weeks in a class on astrophysics, I just decided, oh my goodness, this is really not for me, partly because I didn't find it that exciting. And I took a class in chemistry from an absolute, absolutely fabulous professor, um, and it just fired me up. I just thought, wow, this is exciting, and I really want to know more about it. So I think that was in my, in my sophomore year that I got very interested in chemistry, but at the same time, um, I was also taking design courses at, at Harvard's Carpenter Center. So there was this real duality. I just, you know, I was taking science, I was taking art. Um, and it really wasn't until the beginning of my senior year, uh, uh, I guess, yeah, it was my senior year, end of my junior year, that somehow the two came together. And the way they came together was somewhat unexpected because, um, 
I took, so I took a course in my junior year on the chemistry of vision. So there was a very famous man, George Wald, who had just won the Nobel Prize for his work understanding how the, uh, the proteins in your eye uh, absorb light and transduce a signal that is eventually converted to a neural signal. So he had been studying these opsins, these rhodopsins, and he'd been studying the chemistry of them, how it is when light is absorbed, uh, they undergo a, uh, a conformational change that could in principle generate a signal if it were amplified. Um, and I was a chemist in major and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And so at the end of that course, I started thinking about, gee, I wonder how we see. How does the brain process visual information? Um, and how is it that you know, we can have these amazing perceptions that uh, we appreciate um, in art? And in particular, you know, uh, Joseph Albers at the, at the time was a very famous painter who was studying um, the interaction between colors and especially uh, colors that are adjacent and how a color can look very different uh, depending on the color it's next to, the sort of uh, questions about simultaneous contrast and, and uh, color information processing. And I kept thinking, how does the brain do that? Why is it that colors aren't constant but that they get modulated by uh, their location and their environment. And that brought me to uh, my chemistry professor. I had to choose a lab to do a senior thesis in for honors. And I'm, I'll never forget, I said to him, you know, I really don't like chemistry. <laughs> and he was great. You know, he said, he could have gotten really pissed off. He said, well, what do you like? And um, I said, well, I'm really not sure. But I'm really interested in uh, how we see. And, uh, and I told him about George Wall and everything. And he said, well, you know, there are two new uh, professors over at Harvard Medical School that are just setting up a lab trying to study how the brain processes visual information coming from the eyes. And their names are David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. Of course, later they received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their exploration of the visual pathways. But at the time, they were just young professors. And uh, my advisors had suggested I go over and maybe set up to do a reading course and do a senior thesis. Anyhow, long story short, that was really, I mean, it was just an eye-opening experience for me because it really represented the synthesis of my two interests, you know, the science interest and the chemistry interest on the one hand, and the interest in art and visual perception on the other hand. So the rest is history, basically. Your next step was to do a master's degree in England as a Marshall Scholar. So we are actually here today at the Marshall Scholars Alumni Association meeting. So what was that time like for you? First off, why did you decide to do a Marshall in England and what did you study while you were there? Well, uh, that was one of the best times of my life. There was a two-year, it was a two-year period, um, and it was fabulous because I was in this London, in a great city, in a great uh, institution, University College London, in the physiology department, but also it was a great city culturally, and there was a lot going on in 1969 to 1971, you know, sort of, this was, you know, the hippie period, and this, it was just an explosion of excitement. And then there was Shakespeare and all these other fantastic, you know, dramatic uh, events that you could go to as well. So, um, you know, uh, I didn't decide to do a Marshall Scholarship. The dean of Radcliffe, I guess she was sort of overlooking the performance of students and she approached me and she said, you know, are, you know, do you know what you want to do and are you in a big rush to do the next step in your academic life? Um, because I think you'd be a good candidate for a Marshall Scholarship. And it was really a good intervention because I really didn't know what I wanted to do at that time. I did know that I didn't want to go to medical school. And, you know, I knew I wanted to study the brain, but I also knew that we didn't know enough about how the brain works to really be of help to anyone clinically. And, and it, really, it really hit home because 
a uh, number of years earlier, my grandmother had had a stroke, and uh, she was an amazing woman. Uh, a uh, very she was the first woman in our family. Uh, our family had emigrated from Russia years before, who had actually gone to college. She went to uh, uh, City College, and she was a great tennis player and an athlete. And she was paralyzed, completely paralyzed. She had a right hemisphere stroke paralyzed on the left side and uh, and it was devastating and I had two uncles who were both neurologists and they were brilliant diagnosticians they could say exactly where her stroke was and they couldn't do a damn thing about it so I thought if these two wonderful men who I loved couldn't do anything then I was gonna not go to med school that we needed to learn more but that was as far as I'd gotten in terms of you know some major career decision the other thing is that I didn't know any biology or physiology at all. I mean, I had majored in chemistry. I'd taken chemistry, I'd taken physics, I'd taken organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then I'd done all this sort of design and, and, and uh, so on. And so it was a great interlude. It was suggested by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, my um, undergraduate <coughs> honors thesis advisors, that I might want to go to University College London because there was a lot of very exciting work being done on the nervous system. And so they actually wrote, uh, on my behalf, they wrote a letter to uh, several people at UCL and said, you know, would you take Carla if she got a Marshall Scholarship? And they, they said yes. So it was really guided by these wonderful mentors that I ended up at UCL. And actually, it was funny because when I arrived as a Marshall Scholar, they'd all forgotten that they um, had made a commitment to me for two years. Uh, I mean, they very rapidly, you know, <laughs> fixed it up. But it was pretty funny that I, when I got there, they actually were, oh, what are, what are we going to do with her? Um, but it was an amazing time, and I learned all I learned about human physiology, not just about the brain, but about the circulation system, respiration, all kinds of things. It was fabulous. All right. You were working a little bit with Bernard Katz, who went on to win a Nobel? Well, he taught. So I, there, uh, at the time, he was teaching medical students and undergraduates um, in this uh, BSc program, which is a very, uh, because by the time British students get to be to, at the end of their uh, bachelor's uh, degree, they've already become highly specialized. And so uh, these are like, um, you know, for American students, these would be like taking a series of Woods Hole or Cold Spring Harbor courses, one after the other. They're all lab courses. So Bernard Katz uh, taught a course on, you know, how to study uh, neurons, mm -hmm. for example. And there were courses on how to study the heart and so on. And all taught by these amazing people. And then, of course, you know, Katz later got a Nobel Prize. I also learned how to, you know, fashion the kind of electrodes you need to study the electrical activity of neurons in the brain from uh, uh, another person who was a postdoc in the lab, Bert Sockman, who later also got a Nobel Prize. But, you know, it was great because they were just working at the time. So I, I saw them all just so engrossed in their experiments and so excited by, you know, by the science. So it was extremely good uh, sort of atmosphere there for me. Did you know at that point you were going to go on to graduate school to do a PhD? Yeah, so I knew that I would have to then find a graduate school um, after the Marshall uh, Scholarship was over. Um, and, and yeah. And what made you choose to go back to the Hubel and Weizel? Well, you know, I actually met, I, so I was going to go to Rockefeller, in fact, sort of had planned it and set it all up. But then, uh, uh, I, I mean, I guess the good thing is I, I do always ask for advice. I don't always take it. And actually, a piece of my advice is always ask, um, and then you can make, you know, more informed decisions. And so one uh, person that I asked was some uh, neuroscientist um, at UCL, his name uh, is Semer Zeki, and uh, I was just out to lunch with him one day, and he said, well, what are you going to do? I think he wanted me to stay and do a PhD um, at UCL. But I realized the training was very different, because people were already so specialized at the time that I needed to go back to the U.S. system and learn, uh, really take a few more courses that would uh, give me a, a, a key basis and fundamentals of uh, 
of neuroscience uh, that would that have s since really been helpful. Anyhow, so uh, Samir said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't really know. I think I'll go to Rockefeller. And he said, you're crazy. Why don't you go right back to Harvard and work with Hubel and Wiesel? Because they're doing the most exciting work I can possibly think of at the time. You know, they did not have their Nobel Prize yet. So I wrote to them. And they said, sure, come back. You know, no problem. So that was marvelous. And then they, I, had, I got a second letter saying, oh, by the way, I think you have to apply. <laughs> Fantastic. You stayed at Harvard for your postdoc. What yes. did you then yeah. switch topics to study? Uh, yeah, well, that was another case where I actually got some advice. I thought maybe I should go. Uh, so I studied as a graduate student. I studied um, the functioning of the visual system, like my mentors. And I was very interested in uh, how a, uh, a genetic mutation in Siamese cats um, changed their visual pathways and what that did for visual information processing. Um, that got me really interested in the development of connections because these connections were thought to be hardwired. Um, but clearly they could, if they made a mistake, they could be rewired. And there was some indication that there might even be a kind of use dependent uh, component to the rewiring process. And so I got very interested in the sort of interaction between nature and nurture. You know, nature being sort of the genetic information for the wiring of connections between the eye and the brain, and the nurture part being how the environment then played upon uh, genes uh, that would control the remodeling of circuits by use, by neural activity. And so I was thinking I might go and work on um, regeneration of connections in the brain, which was a, is still a hot to topic, was a very hot topic at the time, but people really only could study it in things like salamanders and newts. And I remember going to David Hubel and saying this, you know, kind of thinking of doing that. And he just looked at me and he said, I didn't invest all this time and energy in training you for you to go off and work on salamanders. <laughs> so I thought, okay. Um, so I went to study brain development uh, from uh, under a uh, wonderful postdoctoral mentor whose name is Pashko Rakic. And he was pioneering, pioneering the study of, uh, well, he was a real expert in human brain development at the time. And of course, that was all based on uh, looking at human autopsy material. It couldn't do that. more than that. There were no imaging. There was no non-invasive imaging. It was all being developed then. Um, but he was pioneering uh, approaches to using animal models to study very, very early brain development, even development um, in the womb. And I wanted to learn those methods from him so that I could go off and go back to studying uh, the development of connections between the eye and the brain. Okay, so you continued your trailblazing spirit um, and moved to the West Coast and came to Stanford as one of the first female faculty hired in the yeah. basic sciences. So what was that time period in your, like, in your life like when you were first establishing your lab and figuring out what you were going to dedicate your career to? Well, it was really exciting. <laughs> it was very, um, I think it was, I, I didn't feel pressure, in fact, and I think it's very different now. Um, and I worry about my junior colleagues in that way because, you know, the first thing to say is that, um, I wrote my first research grant to get money from the NIH, and I got it. And, uh, and that was the expected uh, situation at the time. Um, there was, I mean, it was, now if I look at it now, I never would have gotten it. I mean, it was mostly work not done. Um, so it would have been very high risk, you know, for the NIH to fund it. But they funded me. They had some faith in me. And uh, as I think they should do in all uh, junior investigators now, I mean, you know, you, you have good training, you publish papers as a graduate student, as a postdoctoral fellow, you should be given uh, a little bit of leeway, you know, to succeed or fail. And that did happen in the old days. So the good news there is with a very small startup package from the university and a really significant NIH grant, I mean, I was off and running for five years. So that was a huge, um, there was just no pressure, no, you know, major sort of, you know, ax hanging over me. 
And so I could really get going. Um, I had a lot of uh, faith in my ability to do experiments myself, and I think that's true of most young scientists who come out of labs with good training. So the first thing I did was hire a, a really terrific technician just to help me. So we had two hands. And I would say the biggest challenge for me um, really in setting up my lab was not necessarily setting up my lab. I already knew how to do that. I had taught courses at Cold Spring Harbor, lab courses, where I actually had to set up the labs uh, for the course every year for a few years. So, I mean, I knew I could do that. I think it was really establishing my identity as a woman scientist. And there were sort of two aspects to that. The first was really, I think you'll think it's silly to say it, but it was like, what do I wear to work? And I bring it up um, because I, I kept having this really weird experience of being in my own lab, working in my lab, and having, you know, like the Zeiss microscope sales guy come into the lab, look around, and there were two women in the lab. There was me and there was my technician assistant, and say, okay, well, where's Dr. Schatz? So that was kind of a challenge. And I decided, okay, I'm going to wear pants and a jacket to the lab and see if they might think maybe there was, Dr. Schatz might actually be there at the time. And it seemed to work, actually. Um, the other thing was really to sort of develop a, a rapport with my colleagues and um, also kind of the staff of the department itself. So there'd never been a woman before. I like to tell a story about this. So I get there and um, the entire support staff of uh, secretaries and assistants, they sit in a pool in the middle of the building and you walk in and there they are. And so my assistant was there too. And they were really thrilled that there was a woman, finally, uh, assistant professor in the department. Um, and they were very, very helpful and supportive to me. And so one day I was in uh, working with my assistant and the phone rang. And she picks up the phone and she listens. She says, Dr. Schatz, Dr. Gilbert from Rockefeller University is on the phone and he says it's urgent. Would you like to take the call in here or would you like to take it in your office? And so I think, oh, I'll just take it in, you know, I'll take it in here. I'll, I'll take it in front of all these guys. You know, he's probably going to ask me for some like, you know, eigenfunction value of something or other and I can show off. So Charles Gilbert is on the phone and he says to me, Carla, it's really urgent. I have to get your borscht recipe. So borscht, if you don't know, is a really wonderful Russian soup made from beets. <laughs> and so I'm going, uh-oh. So I give the borscht recipe and I'm looking at the faces of all these women who are sitting around me and they're going, oh. So from that day on, I've never taken phone calls in public. They always go in my office. Anyhow, it was a really good borscht recipe. And we used to exchange recipes all the time because we used to cook together at Harvard as graduate students. You know, you're in the lab all the time. And there was, an off there was a really nice kitchen in the lab. So we did used to cook for each other. Charles is a much better cook than I am, by the way. <laughs> All right, so your science really started to develop during that time, but at one point you moved to Berkeley yeah. in 1992. Yeah. So why make a move? Well, that was, yes, so, um, uh, so I had already received tenure at uh, Stanford, and I was very happy there. But my husband, who's now my ex-husband, uh, my, my husband uh, was looking for jobs also. So this is the two-body problem. Everybody who has a partner goes through this problem. You have to figure out how these two careers are going to work together. And he was offered a job at UC Berkeley. And you know, in those days, I think um, maybe even now, it was much more common for uh, women to follow their husbands than the reverse. And it was certainly true then. And so, uh, so I moved to UC Berkeley. There was a, quite a marvelous job there for me, too. And we were working on trying to have kids at the time. And my, uh, my guy, my, uh, actually, my infertility expert was at a hospital in UC Berkeley. So again, um, I'm sorry, in uh, Oakland, right next door to Berkeley. And you know, this, again, was a time, uh, this was way before uh, there were really good ways of handling infertility. And, and you know, sort of, this was, if I had to say, you know, 
what did I expect as a, uh, a young person? I think I would have said, and, and as a scientist even, I, would, I think I would have said for sure I would have a family and be married. And this is, you know, and I would never have expected to have the kind of wonderful scientific life that I have. But, you know, what I've learned is you never quite, life is never, it goes the way you, you plan it. I have wonderful scientific children, which I didn't expect. Um, and it's the one a aspect of my life, uh, you know, where I, mi I feel like I've really missed out on having a family. But anyhow, so we moved together and, uh, you know, this was a very tough time for us both emotionally and it, it led really to our divorce. And I'm really happy to share this because I really have a lot of advice about how to deal with the challenges of um, trying to start a family um, while you're also trying to start or maintain a really great career. And, and often the two are very difficult to do together. So, I mean, I'm not altogether joking when I say that you should really check your infertility status and know what it is because I had just thought, you know, I was healthy and we were having a great life and I thought that I, di I didn't have to really start having a family until I was about 35. Um, which is like when I got tenure, you know, I think, okay. And, then, and it turned out that I had all kinds of problems that I had no idea about. So I think it's really important to find out what your, infer what your fertility status is like so you can plan in an informed way. And now, of course, there are very easy ways of doing that. Well, at the same time point, while you were, you know, finishing up at Stanford and then moving to Berkeley is when you made some of the discoveries that you're best known for. Not only that uh, the retina does create waves of electrical activity, even in utero, and that some of the main molecular drivers of that were components of the immune system. Yeah. It was like a hugely productive time in the lab, even if it wasn't reproductively productive for me personally, you know. It's true. I mean, I think in many ways, you know, uh, the, the discoveries that we made during that time um, have laid the foundation not only, you know, for what I'm doing now in the lab and also some of my fabulous students are doing, but they really, I mean, they've really, they've turned out to be really fundamental, though at first I have to say there was a huge amount of skepticism uh, about them, which maybe is the best way to say they were truly discoveries because, you know, people didn't expect. So, for example, um, we were really interested in, uh, as I said, this uh, interaction between nature and nurture in brain wiring. And uh, it, had been, uh, it had been shown that the connections from the eye to the brain are highly organized uh, when you look at the adult pattern of connectivity. Um, and so it had been assumed that these connections had to be hardwired from the very beginning. But then uh, we thought, okay, well, we'll study them from the very beginning. And so we learned, I learned how to do uh, uh, experiments uh, to study the very early development of these connections, even in utero, in animal models. Um, and so we could label the growing uh, nerve connections from the eye into the brain. And we were surprised to find that early in development, the adult pattern of connections was not actually even present. And then there was a kind of remodeling of connections to form the uh, very precise adult patterns. Um, and so that was a big shock to everybody because, you know, they were supposed to just be there from the outset. And that led us to ask, what are the underlying mechanisms that drive the remodeling process? And we wondered if that kind of remodeling process might require the connections to form and even function. And that's when we discovered that the eye was sort of auto-dialing, sort of spontaneously generating neural signals and sending them into the brain to test the connections and to remodel the connections. So that was, again, sort of totally unexpected. People, you know, couldn't imagine how that could be happening. And yet now everybody thinks, oh, that's a really good idea. Let's get the system jump started. So when the baby's born, those connections have all been tested already and validated, and that would allow the next part of um, the tuning up process in the visual system, uh, you know, to happen. Terrific. So you're at this peak productivity. It's phenomenal. The stuff that's coming out, you're 
debunking dogma and changing the textbooks, you decided to go to Harvard to go be chair yeah. of neurobiology. Yeah, yeah. Well, there were two reasons for wanting to do that and doing it. I mean, really doing it. I think um, the first uh, is that I had loved my training in the Department of Neurobiology. Um, I had wonderful mentors, uh, very supportive. I never felt that uh, you know uh, that I was uh, being treated differently from all of my male colleagues. Um, so the environment was an extremely healthy environment. I think that's really important to say that even though there were no women tours at the time, there were only mentors. Um, there were great men and uh, really great people. And I felt uh, that this was a time to give back. The department kind of re needed to be rejuvenated. Um, and, uh, and then I felt it was a huge opportunity as a woman to go back and be uh, the first chairwoman of a uh, Harvard Medical School basic science department. So, and that was the case. So I felt like this was a really important opportunity that I really couldn't miss out on, both for my own personal ability to give back and also I think, um, you know, as a woman really trying to be a pioneer at that time. So I, I, I gave up a lot by leaving California, but I gained a lot by going back to Boston. So after nine terrific years then at Harvard, you came back to Stanford to be the director of BioX. Can you tell us a little bit about what BioX yeah, is? and BioX, what... yes, I like to joke that if I tell you what the X is, I have to kill you, but that's not really true, I don't have to. So I came back because um, of, of this uh, nascent program uh, that was attempting and now has successfully um, uh, done a kind of integration across the university of disciplines. So the idea is biology plus let x equal um, chemistry, physics, all of the aspects of engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, um, you know, computer science, and then all of the health sciences and biomedical research. So, so in the health sphere, so the idea of really trying to encourage collaborative interdisciplinary research at the interface of all these fields. And as a neuroscientist, I'd already learned and appreciated that we're not going to understand any complex biological system using only one approach. And of course, the approach at the time that was so powerful was the approach of uh, molecular biology and genetics. But Molecular biology and genetics is not going to tell us, you know, how the brain works. And it's not really going to tell us about perception and consciousness because it will give us incredible insight into disease and also tools, genetic access into uh, trying to manipulate the brain and understand circuits by targeting specific sets of neurons, let's say, for manipulation. Um, but it's really clear that neuroscience is a a beautiful example of interdisciplinary research that requires computation, um, engineering, um, you know, uh, all, all kinds of other disciplines, physics actually, chemistry. Um, and BioX was this writ large, uh, you know, for all fields, not just for neuroscience, but for all fields that are really ha uh, health related. Um, and at the time it was a big experiment. But it was kind of a dream for me because I, I saw that neuroscience needed this as well and that I had a chance to uh, try to understand what this thing is and to facilitate it. So, I mean, in many ways, it was a, it's a program that uh, you can imagine that uh, the classical disciplines at universities are, are like the pillars of the university. Um, and and BioX is like a kind of a horizontal network or grid that's built across the pillars trying to unite them and to break down silos it exists only because of the greatness and the excellence of those the pillars, the disciplines themselves and the schools and the departments. So it seemed really exciting to me and, um, and it has been. I've never looked back. I've been so happy here. 
what would you do if you were not a scientist? You couldn't be a scientist. So <laughs> hypothetical world, couldn't be a scientist. What other vocation do you think would have kept you happy? I can't answer that question. I mean, I'm so happy doing what I'm doing. It's almost inconceivable to me. And I, I mean, I think that in that sense, it's just extraordinarily lucky. I mean, I mean I've had setbacks. I've told you some of them in you know, my personal life. There have been science disasters as well. Um, and I can attribute uh, you know, my joy in my current profession partly to maybe the, being a, you know, a cup half full person and being very optimistic. Uh, but I also think there's a kind of joy in serving others. And so that's partly why I've also you know, done so much in terms of you know, be, going back to be chair of Harvard or doing the BioX thing. It's just tremendously exciting also you know, to facilitate the career of, of, others, of other young scientists. So it's really hard for me to think of other careers. I think I had thought of other careers, you know, sort of ski racer, you know, ballet dancer, I mean, maybe architect. Thank God I didn't become an architect because, you know, in science when you have a failure of an experiment, ah, you go home, you wake up the next morning, you do it again. In architecture, the building falls down. So I don't think that would have been a good career for me, but I, I, I very much admire and think about that as maybe that was, could have been an alternative career. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for spending this time with me telling us a little bit more about your life. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me to participate. It's a real honor. Thanks.